Hello and welcome back to the ROI channel, the channel that's obsessed with the art and science of return on investment. And uh, today we're going to recap the month that was. Uh, we will stick specifically with the uh, performance of the equity fund uh, that I manage. Uh, crisis arbitrage hedge, hedge fund with derivatives is uh, basically tracking along the same in terms of performance. We're going to talk about macro update because there's been a heap of uh, events, as you, you're no doubt aware. And we'll talk about the portfolio positioning and how I'm looking to uh, continue to optimize that and looking into the future. So uh, thank you for watching. If you haven't already liked and subscribed, I greatly appreciate you doing so. Without any uh, further ado, we'll get into it. So the monthly performance is uh, up 2.24% in the month of February. Now, given that we've had the spectre of rising interest rates, which may or may not occur, and we've had the market uh, panicking about that, followed by uh, you know a war essentially uh, in the Ukraine, which is quite horrible to finish up on the month, or well, any month finishing at 2.25% uh, is a good return, but it's particularly when you take into account the macro uh, backdrop and given the amount of cash that we're holding in the portfolio. So, so far so good. I'm very happy with how we've navigated it, but I believe this is only just uh, the beginning of some challenging uh, market waters, which I will need to navigate. So, Let's take a look. We'll take a quick look at performance and the portfolio changes a little bit more in depth. Then we'll talk about the geopolitical tensions that unfortunately have gone kinetic uh, since we last spoke. The central banks, the key players driving liquidity in and out of markets, especially the Federal Reserve, uh, having another excuse not to allow interest rates to rise, in my opinion, that's what we will see. We might get a few token rate rises, maybe 25, maybe 50 basis points, something like that. But this is key when we want to look at the uh, flow of capital and the availability or liquidity of capital in global markets. The PMI is positive. Very interesting. Okay. Not a lot of people would uh, have thought that we'll talk about the uh, implications for that in a second. And of course, uh, the main outcome economically will be the sanctions and the embargoes against Russian goods. Russia uh, exports a lot of goods. Uh, that we in the Western world need. And so we'll talk about what the ripple effects of those may be and how I'm going to position the portfolio. Obviously, the, the eToro portfolio is one in which you're interested in. You may be a copier of the portfolio invested. So we're going to tailor it more to your interest in this video, uh, but also what I'm doing uh, with my other funds and uh, personal money outside. Okay, so we take a screenshot here of the performance. We were all over the place um, since the start of the year. We knew this was going to be a very volatile year. We were up nearly 6% on January, and then we went a swing uh, down 4.94% on the month. Uh, so the delta of that is basically 10% in a month, which is crazy. Uh, February is what we're talking about. So two and a quarter percent up on the uh, month. If you verse uh, that over the S&P, we have outperformed uh, by 12.46%. So that's supposed to be an alpha there. Okay, I'm not the best with the mouse uh, drawer. But when you think about the broader market uh, has been about 8% sold off in the month and year to date over 10%. And so we've been able to, to capture a nice uh, spread we've been profit in real terms and then in relative terms we've also been able to outperform the s p which is a goal of the fund here we look at the s p again just to further hone the point that we had a 12.46 percent alpha um taking those two numbers into consideration and uh, but the, the year is uh, obviously quite young and who knows what we're going to come up against and uh, Reasons for this will be, as I've spoken about in the past, being extremely disciplined as to the multiples, uh, the valuation multiples paid for assets, as well as the sector diversification, and particularly the weighting towards the energy sector. I've been banging on about that for quite some time now. I had, no, I really couldn't have predicted the uh, kinetic conflict would break out. It was one of many possible scenarios. And even without the conflicts, we would still be seeing the energy uh, sector continue to grind upwards as uh, 
as a result of the recent conflict, it's been more of a, an explosion to the upside as opposed to a continual grind. So the asset allocation and then the assets in terms of sector and then the asset selection have really helped us using hedging strategies. So selling short the uh, triple Qs, which is a proxy for the NASDAQ uh, has acted as a very good hedge. And we've actually made uh, money on that in the short term. So while we have what I consider to be an overvalued uh, broad market, particularly in the tech centered NASDAQ. And we had a very undervalued energy, um, commodities, prime resources. Uh, we went obviously long and short in the, uh, in accordance with the valuations that I perceived. And so far we seem to be capturing that, uh, that Delta very nicely. So portfolio changes have been quite a bit. Um, two of the companies that I really liked, uh, unfortunately had to be sold. Forexpo was sold uh, almost a month ago now, uh, certainly a couple of weeks where we just had to ed exit. We didn't take much of a loss uh, on that. Luckily, if it were, if it was the case of uh, a conflict uh, playing out, which unfortunately is the case, I mean, Forexpo have actually cease their operations who knows when they're going to be back online so we just had to exit that gazprom as a result of um, sanctions on western investors holding the um, the shares of the company okay it's a great business i believe it will continue to to thrive uh, possibly better than ever who knows um, but unfortunately yeah it's not a stock that that we can hold i've also sold unfi uh, not because it's a bad business. I just think that there are better opportunities out there. So I've sold out of that. We only had about 1% of assets under management uh, anyway. And I think that their margins will start to come under more pressure than I originally anticipated. So it makes more sense if we've got a better option over here, let's free up some of our options that aren't as good and allocate the capital accordingly. And yeah, we had some small hedges. I freed up some cash in the portfolio, okay, from selling the above position, but also from trimming FISO. FISO was one of the bigger positions. I am still bullish on these type of businesses that can, what I call clip the ticket uh, type businesses. So your fire serves, uh, PayPal to a, a degree, uh, Stone Co is another one we own. These payment processes that will continue to charge their percentage fees on all the different transactions moving into a higher inflationary environment that I expect will have a higher turnover or velocity of transactions and a higher nominal amount. So these guys should do quite well. They're an asset light business, but I think that there are better opportunities that I wanted to um, double down on and move into. So let's talk about those. I've added to Synovus, Glencore, Royal Mail, Foot Locker, and GoPro. So Synovus and Glencore, Glencore might be the best business at the moment that no one seems to be interested in. Um, it's a diversified materials, uh, prime producer and, uh, commodity kind of trading house. Okay. They have their own proprietary traders. It's just an amazing business that's all over the world. And this is unfortunately exactly the type of environment where Glencore thrives. They are no stranger to conflict. They're no stranger to embargoes, geopolitical tensions. Yeah, I'd say it's their specialty of being able to, to circumnavigate those uh, for a very handy profit. They have humongous uh, derivatives positions in that will profit from the rise in oil and gas and basically every commodity they own. Um, they have a, a fantastic asset base in terms of their, their mines, which includes coal. And if you're looking at the coal futures today, going up 45%, one of them on a day, uh, obviously that's all money in the bank for Glencore. Synovus I've talked about before, very simple Canadian oil sounds play. It is now the, uh, number one player, in my opinion, in Canada, in the sense that they have the refinery having merged with Husky energy spoken about that before Royal mail group is a solid business. That's just simply sold off way too, uh, way too far. It's, it's ridiculous trading at, uh, just over three times enterprise value to EBITDA. So given an update on that, the cash flow, uh, yield on the company is fantastic. The balance sheet is strong. They can, and I believe will start to buy back a lot of their shares and will essentially form uh, a floor under the share price. Same, it's exactly the same deal with Foot Locker. They've sold off, um, about 35%. However, based on fears that losing their, their contract with Nike, there are plenty of other brands out there. This is far too cheap. The company is going to back buy back almost half of the float. Okay. 41% of the float at current prices. So essentially you're looking at a, 
a ready-made buyer. Okay, the company is going to cannibalize itself, shrink its number of outstanding shares, and even if it can maintain a decent uh, amount of earnings into the future, because the amount of uh, shares have been retired or will be retired after the program is complete, it's going to it's going to have a massive kick to the upside, in my my view. GoPro is a very resilient business, high free cash flow conversion, trading very cheaply, having been sold off, and with a really strong brand so 91 percent market share uh, goes to gopro so there's our uh, additions new position is at liberty global okay i'll do an assessment on that uh, again a diversified uh, conglomerate in media space is how i would um, summarize in a nutshell uh, also a play on the internet of things in 5g our biggest position so far by value is Micron, okay? And semiconductors are going to be extremely important moving into the future. Micron is the way that I've chosen to play it because uh, I thought it was about the best value out there on entry. We're also in Intel, okay? And reason being Intel is diversified away from um, Taiwan, okay? So for geopolitical tensions in the future, uh, Intel have... Uh, a, a great turnaround initiative that, that I think will do very well, positioning themselves in the United States. 25 positions at the moment, so we've really cut back. We've got 24 long and one short. I've sold short the QQQ ETF, which is a proxy for the NASDAQ, keeping in line that uh, long short investment thesis that I mentioned before. The average PE of the portfolio as a whole is 16 times, okay? So basically half of where we were um, at the start of the year with the NASDAQ and the S&P. So we really have not overpaid for businesses. That's been a, a key component uh, of my focus. And we also currently hold 15% in cash, okay? So 15% waiting in cash for the portfolio. Geopolitics, I'm not gonna to spend too much time on this. Uh, social media is uh, rife with uh, all different ideas. However, a quick synopsis as to how it may affect our portfolio and how I'm positioning. The Russians have invaded Ukraine. Okay, a little typo there. We know that Western sanctions, um, questionable as to how far they will go with that. Banning from the SWIFT system hurts Western investors. Does it hurt the Russians? It remains to be seen. I'm sure it does hurt some Russians. The Russian stock holdings are now basically illegal, yeah, for want of a better word, for Western investors. Okay, so stocks will be uh, delisted by the time you're watching this i'm sure they have been all delisted from the london stock exchange as well as the american depository receipts uh, that were trading on american exchanges for russian companies uh, gazprom had one of those and uh, on other european markets as well like the the deutsch uh, deutsch boss i believe exports uh considered contraband in basically all the um, united nations not in the, the official sense of the un but in the sense of uh, let's call it uh, the Western uh, allies at the moment. So Russia looks like they will be uh, diverting all the exports that were previously coming to us in the West, and they will move them over to the East in China, India, uh, the UAE, and potentially more. We'll see uh, how other, other countries start to perhaps change their tune when they have rising inflationary costs and their people start to rebel. And so it remains to be seen who's really going to uh, get the upper hand as a result of these actions. Key markets that will be affected, obviously commodities, okay? So oil, gas, coal, wheat, palladium, and urea are the big ones, urea particular in, uh, particularly in the case of fertilizers, okay? Alrighty, so if we take a look over to the US, the purchasing managers index is actually still positive, okay? So January, February, uh, it actually grew a little bit, okay? So 1% uh, month over month. And what this is is basically uh, managers in manufacturing their opinion on their f forward demand. So do they think they're going to have more, um, more demand? Are they going to get busier or are they going to get quieter? Okay. And they come up with, uh, an index and they use, uh, kind of like the CPI, they will use a relative rate of growth and they'll have the top half. So if, if it's the results are 50% or above. The economy is still in growth. If the results are below 50, the economy is starting to go into contraction. So it does have a decent correlation in terms of figuring out what is going to happen in the economic future. If we start to see this PMI dip below 50, we can start to then uh, anticipate recessions uh, out 
maybe three uh, months at the earliest. Okay, so it is a leading indicator with a, a high correlation. Okay, but as I mentioned, it's still positive. So with all the tension going on, we still uh, have a positive uh, PMI. The growth rate may be starting to slow, and as uh, input materials and input costs due to rising energy and inflation start to rise. I think the margins for a lot of manufacturers will start to be squeezed. And then it's a case of, or a question of whether consumers out there can actually afford to buy uh, and put in these orders for what will no doubt be higher prices coming off the, the manufacturing because they have to pass the costs on somewhere. And, you know, with with oil starting to rise, oil will go and go and go and go and go until it can't because people literally stop producing anything because oil, uh, like it or not, is in everything. So this will be a key one to keep an eye on. I think that oh, I've already spoken about commodities. The Fed are unlikely to raise rates much further. They may do one or two token ones, uh, but inflationary pressures will continue to remain. Okay, uh, CPI may come in lower, which will be another excuse for the Fed, but that will be due to the base effects. So we had 2020 where everything fell off a cliff, and so 2021, you're measuring the change in consumer price index from 2022, and obviously now from 2020 rather in 2022 we're going to be using that relatively higher base effect from 2021 and so uh, i would be surprised if we could continue to hit a seven um based off last year it might be more like a three but when you look at that as a result or as a rate of change from two to three years ago it's obviously a massive um, annualized change okay plan and positioning for the portfolio moving forwards so we're going to continue to invest in the core group of high quality cash flowing assets, cash flow, cash flow, cash flow is what I really harp on when coming up with a core group. That means being very disciplined around the enterprise value to free cash flow multiples that I pay for the assets. Okay. Small hedges from now and then, mainly against those uh, sectors or, yeah, or companies that I believe uh, stand to be the weakest against rising inflationary pressures. And that may not necessarily be rising interest rates because as I've just told you, the Fed will likely have an excuse to um, be slightly less hawkish. Instead, it might come in the, might, I mean, it all but certainly will come in the form of rising energy or input costs. So that'll be interesting to see how that all plays out. Heavy weighting on commodities and energy and light on financials and insurance. The financials are making a lot of money um, at the moment because their lending spread is, is quite large. So they have overnight funds rate that are very, very low and they can lend out on uh, you know, seven to 10 years on consumer or business loans and then 20 to 30 years on um, usually mortgages and that type of thing. However, when they might be making 4% on that spread. But what starts to happen as inflation takes off, their, their real yields, they're actually be, uh, negative. So if we've got inflation of 6% and you've got a credit spread that you're making as a profit of 4%, you're going backwards by 2% uh, every year compounded. And that's something that I don't think we've really seen enter the financial sector yet or that, that people are really thinking about. Insurance is a little bit different because there's ways that you can offset that and you're collecting the premium so you can start to um, you can start to pass on a certain amount of that cost to the consumers in the way of higher premiums. We are in general with financial and uh, all state insurance, uh, our exposure to the insurance space, but we have trimmed down on both of those positions. Core positions are still in North America and we just need <laughs> yeah, we need to avoid any potential sanctions. So Russia and Russian allies uh, are places that uh, I won't be playing uh, in, in in funds where I have investors um, invested, if that makes sense. Uh, China, we don't do anything in China anyway. So that's not so much of a concern because we, we just can't trust the numbers, basically. Small speculations in turnarounds and or emerging markets. So that would be, uh, for an example, Intel, we've got a decent position. We've got a small position in Liberty because they do have a lot of debt. We have small positions in uh, Transocean, for instance, uh, a highly indebted company, but at oil prices this high, their day rates have skyrocketed and they're, they're able to retire that very quickly. Okay, they're trading for like less than a fifth of book value and it's just a, 
it's just a really peculiar opportunity for right now. And so it deserves some space in the portfolio because I believe that we could get potentially a 10 bagger uh, from that one. Emerging markets would be Stone Co. And I still think there's a great opportunity with Stone Co., even though it has been absolutely uh, raised almost to the ground. And that is why I kept it at uh, just over 1%. I have to be very disciplined. As much as I'd like to add to it, I can't, uh, given the current weighting of the portfolio. And as I said, I'm holding 15% in cash for a rainy day. I'll still look to buy a little bit more of Foot Locker and we'll wait and see as to, to what else might, uh, might enter the portfolio from there. Okay, so uh, I've brought this up many times before. This comes from Howard Marks's book, uh, Mastering the Market Cycle. Okay, here we're looking at a visual representation of assets, their value movement over time and their price movement. So the squiggly line would be the price movement relative to the straight line here in terms of a company's theoretical intrinsic value. So where I'm looking at things at the moment, I'm thinking that commodities, even though they're starting to move, they're still in this cheap cycle. Okay. They've got a long runway for growth ahead. Uh, fair value would be some of the, uh, some of the better tech companies such as Dropbox to a degree, um, eBay to a degree, anywhere that is perhaps not growing as fast as people want, but you don't have to pay the crazy high multiples. And then these are the, <laughs> these are where you're paying, you know, 30 to 40 X, uh, earnings or cash flows. And for companies that in, in some cases don't even have any, don't even have any profits. Uh, and that's that our target returns, uh, 2.24% per month will give us a 20% uh, CAGR, but obviously it's not as simple as doing that month in month out guys. Some years we might be down for the entire year. Other years we might be up astronomically. This is, uh, on an annualized uh, average basis over time. Looking to outperform the S&P, we've done that so far and protected capital, which I'm very proud of in a very difficult environment. So this is what we're looking to achieve. Okay. We're, we're not even at year one, as I've said. Okay. So it's very easy to get frustrated and, uh, and flustered when you're looking at uh, daily movement patterns and there's bearish news all over the media, then there's bullish news all over the media. Do your very best not to look at it, allow the process, make sure you understand what we're trying to achieve. And what I'm trying to achieve. And if you do decide that you want to be a part of it, great, but understand where I'm coming from and what we're aiming to achieve. That will allow you to just take it easy when things are getting a little crazy, obviously an appropriate uh, allocation as well. So if you've got your life savings in something and uh, you start to see volatility and fluctuation, it's going to be hard for you to rest easy. Having said that, thank you for watching. Please like and subscribe if you can. I am on Twitter if you want to connect with me, like the gentleman from Finland who uh, we were talking about a particular investment, so that was nice. And if you haven't already checked out the portfolio, please download, or if you want to download eToro, download eToro and check it out. Otherwise, you can jump on the app and add us to a watch list. If you've got funds and you'd want to invest in a value uh, portfolio, you can copy the portfolio, choose any amount that you want, and you'll now have an investment that mirrors the portfolio that I manage uh, with eToro. Thank you for watching. Disclaimer, as you know, I'm not a financial advisor. I'm not your financial advisor. None of this is advice. This is just my opinion, what I'm doing with my money and what I'm doing with uh, you know, eToro and outside of eToro. So please, I could be wrong. This is all just my opinion and what I'm doing. Don't make a decision just because I'm doing it or because anyone else is doing it. You need to be responsible uh, for your own thought process, your own due diligence. And so please take that uh, responsibility seriously. Having said that, I hope you enjoyed the video and I look forward to catching up with you uh, next time.